Oh, man, it's so good to see you all. Thanks for being at Rock Hills today. You guys having a good day? Good day? Nice. Anybody get a hot dog? Any people in here get a hot dog? All right, cool. That's good. Uh, some were eating it for breakfast this morning, so that's, that's interesting. Well, welcome everybody that's watching online. Hope you all are doing good, too. Man, y'all, you may know this, but we have some soldier servicemen and women serving our country, some of which are deployed right now, and you're tuning in, which we think is pretty incredible. Uh, and so whoever you are, wherever you are, thanks for watching with us. Uh, but everybody in person, would you just share the love, show love, give it up for those watching online. Come on now. Hope you guys are doing well. Oh, man, I'm so excited. It's such a big day, everybody. It's such a huge day. And, uh, man, just great anticipation uh, for this day. And, and, uh, and I know you know what it is. You know what I'm talking about. Because today is National Inventors Day. Come on now. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> Look it up. It really is. How exciting. And uh, so I know you all be having people over celebrating that today. It's going to be good. Uh, and there's something else happening today that you may not know about called the Super Bowl. So um, I do want to just throw this out there, though. Uh, if you still want to go, you better hurry. But the average Super Bowl ticket right now is $10,752. So that's not too bad. <laughs> Most of us can do that. Um, and if that's priced a little steep, then uh, you can join. They estimate maybe because of thanks to Taylor Swift, $200 million potentially to watch which would be 60% of the United States population if that ends up happening, uh, which is nuts. Last year was 115 million people watched, the most watched show ever. And, uh, and so I just want to help you. If you have a little watch party going on, I want to just give you some information that may be helpful. Watch party on average in America is about 14 people. Uh, the average calories consumed for a, f- a football party feast is about 8,000 plus. <laughs> That's awesome. I plan on getting close to that myself. Just in a few hours. That's pretty cool. There'll be 1.45 billion chicken wings eaten. So you may want to pre-order those. And then uh, over 11 million pounds of potato chips. Have you ever held a bag of potato chips? Not very heavy. That's crazy. 11 million pounds. That's nuts. Um, 90% more beer will be consumed on Super Bowl Sunday than an average day. And uh, and so <clears throat> I know everyone's surprised by that. And then... But I bring that stat up because I think it plays a role in this one. 18.8 million people will miss work tomorrow, <laughs> which will amount to around 9.2 billion in lost product- productivity for companies. <laughs> so that's, isn't that awesome? But don't worry, everybody, because you know that the National Inventors Day are working on a solution today. So we're going to be good. They're coming up with an AI possibility for that or something. So. Uh, you know, this all week just been watching about how people, you know, think they're pretty good judge on who's going to win the Super Bowl. I actually have the ESPN predictor I want to show you, so we can throw that up there. Uh, so almost 60 for the Niners and then 40 for the Chiefs. And uh, I think that's a good thing because I think any times Mahomes is an underdog, <laughs> I feel pretty good about that. So that's, that's exciting. Uh, so I want to ask this question. How many of you in here think you're a pretty good judge on who's going to win? Anybody? Anybody? It's pretty good, about four people. All right, show me uh, who thinks the Niners are going to win. Raise your hand. Okay. You guys are confused. You have several different jerseys on. And the one that you cheered for is not on. So uh, how many of you think the Chiefs are going to win? Raise your hand. Yes. Yes. Not as many as I thought. Uh, how many of you, this is my favorite question, raise your hand in the air if you just don't care. Anybody out here doesn't care? Good. That's usually the most people for the day, so, uh, which is exciting. So here we go. Uh, so we all we're in part number four of a series we've been in. We took a break last week. We have two weeks before that. We've been in Romans, uh, going through the book of Romans. When in Rome is because that was a statement back in the day when Paul writes this, when in Rome. It's kind of like when in Vegas, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, kind of like Rome was. And so he's writing God's truth in a culture that was definitely um, not following God's truth. And uh, and how do you live out Christianity in a culture that does it? That's kind of why we're doing this series. And and let me tell you why we're really doing this series is because God put it on my heart several months ago ago, that I think we should be talking about uh, not only Romans, but just we need to be grounded in our truth as followers of Jesus. Um, because we live in a, in a culture that where if we're not grounded in, in the truth of God, 
uh, we may let go of the truth of God. And uh, the more we lose our mind when we see things happening in the economy and election year, everybody, I'm telling you, people are going to lose their minds. I'm just, you say, are you a prophet? No, I'm just telling you. That's going to happen. And uh, when we lose our minds, we tend to lose our way. And so what keeps us grounded is the truth in God's word. So that's why we're going through Romans. We, just, we need to be grounded in the gospel of God's grace and the, and the truth behind God's truth that comes out of Paul through the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans, which some say is the greatest letter ever written, um, and many say is the greatest theological letter ever written, uh, is uh, the truth in that Romans has the power to transform our hearts and minds. And, and that's really why. We're going through Romans because because I hope the truth of God's word would transform my heart, my mind, your heart, your mind, and would help ground us in, in God's truth, especially when life gets crazy, so that we continue to 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 grow through life's uh, trials because we can hold on to God's promises in the process. So, um, so as we do that, we we went through chapter one. <laughs> And so there's 16 chapters, everybody. So we, we just made it through chapter one. We're starting chapter two today. We're going to cover the first six verses. And the reason I talked about are you a good judge is because Paul is going to talk about that topic of judging. In fact, the title for today for this sermon is this, Judging the Judging of Those Who Judge. <laughs> judging the Judging of Those Who Judge. And, and, uh, and so if you've been on the journey, Paul, we've said this, is basically making a case He's like the prosecuting attorney. God is the, is the judge. He's the judge of the whole universe. And, and who's the trial against? Us. Humanity, mankind. And Paul does a really good job of laying out this letter. In fact, at this point in the letter, just having gone past a couple weeks ago, Romans 18 through 32, Paul could literally, at this point in the letter, say, Hear ye, hear ye, court is now in session. The honorable God, judge of the universe, presides. Right? And, and, uh, and so... So it is basically Paul laying out a case for why we need the gospel. And he understands something crucial about the human heart. And the whole theme, by the way, of the book of Romans is God's righteousness. But to help us understand God's righteousness, Paul knows that he has to deal with the unrighteousness of man. Because until man and mankind, men and women, know that we are sinners, then men and women cannot appreciate the gracious salvation of God offered in Jesus Christ, unless we really understand our need. And one of the challenges, I believe, in our culture, of church culture in America, is that we think, nah, I'm good. I don't know if I really need God. I've seemed to be doing pretty good on my own. And Paul, not only wants, I think, our culture to understand, but definitely one of the Roman culture to understand, that you've got to understand how much you need God before you really appreciate his offer of salvation. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Tim Keller said this. He said, no one is so good that they don't need the grace of the gospel, and no one is so bad that they can't receive God's grace. So I love that because that's so true. Nobody's so good. Nobody said, I'm a good person. Nobody is ever good enough on their own works where they did not need desperately God's grace. And then at the same time, which this one I'm really thankful for, is nobody's ever been so bad, messed up, so big, blown it so much that they can't receive God's grace. And uh, that's really the gospel, everybody. So just to kind of recap, lay a groundwork, as Paul lays out his case, he basically says this, that choosing my way over God's way in any way is sin. Whenever we suppress and reject God's truth and say, I want to do it my way, I'm good, no thank you, God, I got this, when we suppress his truth, that sin and sin separates from God, separates us from God. And then sin is not just the act I commit. This is really important. It's not just the act I commit because sometimes we think, man, I did something and I sinned. Typically, uh, always, that happens before you get to the act in your mind, in your heart. So sin is not just the act I commit. It's the authority I reject. Bottom line, Romans 1, Paul says this, the human heart, every human heart, has a love affair with yourself, with doing what you want to do as opposed to going God's way, you go your way in any way. And so then Paul, this is, this is a lot of fun, he now gives in chapter 1 24 ways we reject God and do what we want to do. He gives 24 different ways we sin. 
And then he gets to the end of that. And, and when you get to the end of that, we said that, that you, you get to the end of that 24 Cinerama list that Paul just gives, and, and here's, here's the response. Guilty. No, nobody gets off the hook. That's the point. Nobody gets off the hook. Wow. So Paul, man, he covered like some disorders. And when we say disorders, that means anything that's out of the natural order of what God originally intended under, you know, like under his umbrella of grace of how he set things up, anything that's outside of that is disorder. It's if you walk up to a soda machine, it says out of order. You know what that means. It's broken. It ain't working. So Paul covers in 24 different ways we sin. He talks about sexual disorder, economic disorder, social, spiritual, family, and relational disorder. Things that are broken because we reject God's way and we want to do it our way. So aren't you glad if you missed the last couple weeks? Aren't you glad that you missed church the last couple weeks? Well, we ought not to be. Um, because one of the healthiest things we can ever do is say, Holy Spirit, would you give me a good old-fashioned heart assessment? Would you, like David said, search me in my inmost being. God, would you show me any way that is offensive to you? Because some of them I know and some of them I just don't know. But if there's any way in me, God, that's offensive to you, oh, David said, would you show me? And that's something healthy that we can do. So you think after 24 ways we reject God, like Paul would be done, right? That's his closing of his opening argument. But honestly, welcome to chapter two, everybody. Because Paul, who's laying, in a ca- laying out a case, literally gets to the place where he's like, okay, and then I got you there. Now, now that I've set the backdrop, I'm going to introduce you to the deadliest sin in the world. It's almost as if Paul takes off his jacket at this point, rolls his sleeve up, and says, it's game day, baby. It's game time. And he's going to talk about even more so the human heart. And he's going to describe the deadliest sin in the world. And that's what we're going to look at today. What we might need to understand of why this is the deadliest sin in the world is because, well, rich people do it. Poor people do it. Christians do it. Non-Christians do it. Educated people do it. Non-educated people do it. The firstborn in the family do it, and the favorite child, because we all know the firstborn is not the favorite. I mean, we're the youngest, and so we can attest to that, right? So, so the reason we're going to talk about this today is, uh, well, let's just jump into what Paul says. Now, get ready, buckle up, everybody, because Paul is taking us on a journey of the human heart where we really need to fully understand how desperate we are for God's mercy. Romans 2.1, you therefore, Paul says, Have no excuse. You who fill in the blank. You who murder. You who lie. You who pass judgment on someone else. What? Paul says, that's the deadliest sin in the world. You who hear the list of 24 and go, yeah, Paul, get them. Get them. Get those people. Get those pagans. Get those heathens. That. Get him, Paul. <laughs> See, Paul knows as he's writing this, the questions and the response of people's hearts. You look at that list of 24, and, and you could be like the self-righteous leaders who go, well, thank God I'm not like them. So Paul says to that person, those people, you who pass judgment on someone else, you have no excuse. For at whatever point you pass judgment on another, you are condemning yourself. Because you pass judgment and do the same things. Now, listen, when he says the same things, he's not talking about you do number four on the list of 24 too. You too. He's not talking about you do the same things as number three or number five on the list of 24. He's saying you do the same things when you reject God's authority and ways in your life, but then look at other people and areas that they may struggle in that may not be a struggle for you. But you judge them as if you don't have any struggles yourself. You do the same things. That those people you don't like do, when you go, they're sinning, when you reject God's authority, you are now doing the same thing. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 2, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. In other words, God doesn't get up one morning and start judging based on his mood that day or based on the opinion. God doesn't get up on the wrong side of heaven, thank God. 
because he never has to get up. Apparently, he's always awake. So there you go. So he lets us know that God's judgment is accurate, not partial truths. It's precise. So when you, a mere human being, in other words, you who cannot judge accurately because you're human, <laughs> you, 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 you judge off partial truths. You, you can't judge like God who's accurate every single time, who's not swayed by mood or frustration. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, who's them? Those people. Whenever you say those people who do those things, whenever you pass judgment on them and yet do the same things. He says, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt? Listen to this verse four. Do, or do you show contempt? That word's so important. Lean in, lean in. It means disregard or disrespect. Do you show contempt, like contempt in court? Do you, do you show disregard and disrespect for the riches, which, by the way, are incomprehensible? God's riches and wealth, incomprehensible. Do you show disregard and disrespect for the riches of God's kindness? Like the pile-high kindness that you can't fathom that God gives you? Do you show disregard and disrespect for that for you when you judge other people? Do you have disrespect or disregard for his forbearance? What's that mean? It means that God has the right to, to move forward in legal action against you, but he restrains. Do you show disrespect or disregard to God's incom incomprehensible riches of his forbearance of restraint to you and just go ahead and judge somebody else? Do you show disregard and disrespect for God's unlimited amount of patience to you and forget about that and just go ahead and judge somebody else? When you do that, verse 4, are you not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Did you know that it is God's kindness that leads you to repentance? Verse 5 and 6, but because of your stubbornness, Paul's, and, and most scholars think that Paul is now writing to legalistic Jewish people who would have heard that list of 24 of those pagan heathen sinners and been like, yeah, those people. And Paul's writing them kind of saying like, lean in and listen, this is so important about your own heart. Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. And God will repay each person according to what they have done. Not you, but God will. Do you leave room for God's vengeance in his hands? Or are you quick to say, no, I think I'm a good judge. Give me that black cloak and give me that gavel. I think I, think I am good enough to have the final authority on what I think other people should and shouldn't do. So Paul's talking about I don't know if this relates to anybody today, but it sure relates to me. Paul's talking about the deadliest sin in the world. What is it? You probably know it's self-righteousness. It's self-righteousness. Scary place to be, my friends, a.k.a. judging others. Now, let me talk about what judging isn't because we're like, you see, don't judge me. Man, followers of Jesus are like, back off, don't judge me. Like, well, we're not talking about today observance evaluation, and discernment. Let me give you an example. When I was in college, um, I had a couple of my buddies come up to me, and uh, you, know, you know sometimes surprise parties are interventions, you know what I'm saying? So I show up, a couple of buddies, they want a surprise party. Troy's the only one surprised. It's an intervention. And they sit down and they say, dude, hey, we've kind of made an observation. Man, we're a little concerned. We think you may have a problem with drinking. Now, in that day, I should have been like, wait a minute. You guys are doing the same things I'm doing, and you're concerned? It should have been a light bulb. should have went off and been like, dang, I probably do have a problem. Because if they're saying that, knowing what they're doing, and they're concerned about me, hmm. But you know what I did? Don't judge me. Who are you? What they were doing is making an observation out of concern. And, man, I really wish I would have listened 
instead of writing it off. You know why? Because that led me to a destination that was horrific. So they were making an observation, and observations aren't bad. Evaluations aren't bad. Listen, sometimes parents are like, I just want little Johnny, I want my kid to be able to decide what's right and wrong for themselves. I want them to be able to determine what they ought to do. And, and uh, so, Johnny, if you want to go to the fifth grade, I mean, you just do what you do you, Johnny. What do you think? Is that good? No, I'm going to tell Johnny, you're going to finish elementary, man. You, you don't do that with the fifth grade. Why would you do that in other things? Like, you're going to finish school because someday you're going to get out of this house. You know what I'm saying? Can I get an amen? Okay. So when I observe, evaluate, and discern, that's not what we're talking about. But what, what listen, listen, what self-righteousness and judgment really is, I think, is when I size you up and write you off. When I think that I am such a good judge that give me the gavel and I yield it to say, I may not have all the facts, I may not have all the evidence, I may not know the whole story, but I am fit to make the final authority call. And I size people up and I write them off and say things like, oh, they'll never do that. Or you're always going to be or you, you can't call yourself whatever. And oftentimes when we make judging calls like that, I mean, listen, everybody, golly, in our culture, it's like apple pie and baseball. It's like a national pastime. You don't believe me? Watch the commercials tonight. I mean, it just blows my mind how it doesn't make any sense to have a culture that says, don't judge me. We, we're all about picking up our rights instead of laying them down and picking up our responsibilities. We're all about, you know what? Not easy. I'm not, I've never been political, and I'm not going to start in the noon service today. because It has nothing to do with that. But honestly, it has everything to do with my own personal heart. When I say, okay, um, yeah, I'm sure I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not like that. That's a, that's a very dangerous place to be in. When I size people up and I write them off. And why do we do it? Here, here's why I think why we do it. Lots of reasons, but one that is for sure. We often lack true self-awareness. One of the quickest indicators of our own heart that there may be signs of dysfunction is when we can point out the wrongs in other people so quick, but we're blind to our own. Or maybe we're not blind to our own, but we just don't want to hear from anybody else who may speak into our life. But we're so quick to point out others. And we do that because we lack true self-awareness. So let me, let me just share some statements because, you know, so many times it's like we, this is, hey, I'm basing what I think is I'm the right judge based on what I see and what I think I hear. And sometimes what we think we see and what we think we hear can, can, can be a little gray. <laughs> For example, let me give us some examples. You ever heard someone, maybe you've said this, maybe you've heard someone say, man, they are such a gossip. Oh, drives me nuts. They're such a gossip. Now, hey, don't tell anybody I'm telling you this, but they are such a gossip. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. Or on the other side, the flip side of that is I'm just sharing a concern. I'm just so concerned, and let me tell you, for 25 minutes, their entire story, because I'm, con bless God, I'm concerned. <laughs> They're so lazy. Ugh, man, I wish they'd get a job. On the flip side of that, man, I'm just easy going. I'm just a free spirit, everybody. I'm just. They're always so negative. I mean, like negative Ned, negative Nancy, ugh, so negative. I'm just being realistic. I'm just being realistic, everybody. I'm just a gift. It's just what I do. Um, man, they are so critical. Or on the flip side of that, I'm just telling the truth. You ever hear anybody say, man, I'm just being honest, as if that's like a license to be a turd? Oh, I didn't know you were being honest. Oh, well then, go ahead and just be a turd. Go ahead and be a jerk then, because I didn't really. Do you know when you say, I'm just being honest, for anybody ever does that? I'm just being honest. Do you know that you may not, you may think you're accurate, but you may not be accurate in your honesty. It's important just to realize some things that may, we may have some blind spots in. Now, after saying those things, you know what's awesome is you probably thought about a lot of other people, which means you have failed the test. Isn't it crazy hard to not just focus on where am I, 
on the journey to let God's word penetrate your heart instead of get a picture of somebody else in your head? If that's the case, then, man, I think it's worth the price of admission today. I think, I think you came on a good day. You may get something out of it. Judging, here's the truth, appeals to our pride. Our pride. What is our pride? Reject God. I don't need you, God. I'm good. I think I'm good. I think I'm good at being able to judge other people. I think pride equates for ego, which I think stands for edging God out, which is very dangerous. Sin separates us from God. Ego, pride, is a God repellent. If you want God to get far, far from you, just walk around full of pride. On the flip side of that, this is just really helpful. If you want the Holy Spirit to be really close, you want God to be close to you, humility is like an invitation. Humility is an invitation to the Holy Spirit. Pride is like carbon monoxide of sin. Because very rarely do you sense it, that it's in you, or sense that it's around you, but it's kind of like a silent killer. That's what pride does. Um, How many of you guys remember... um, this guy, a deep theologian, uh, Jeff Foxworthy. Does anybody remember that guy? Yes? Yeah. yeah. So how many of you remember he did um, some you might be a redneck if jokes? Anybody remember those? Those of you that do remember, you might be a redneck. That's not one of his jokes. I just made that up. But he had some jokes that were pretty funny, and he said things like, you might be a redneck if your belt buckle weighs more than three pounds. That's pretty good. It's true. Honestly, when I first heard these, I was like, I thought these were truth statements. These are jokes. That was news to me where I grew up in southwest Missouri. One of those that I thought was just how it was, was if your home has wheels but several of your cars do not, you might be a redneck. I was like, what? It's my whole family. Interesting. Um, Here's one. This is my favorite, by the way. Uh, If you're on TV multiple times explaining what a tornado sounds like, you might be a redneck. That's hilarious. I don't care who you are. That's just funny. It gets funnier the more you think of it. So I want to do is uh, do a little bit. You might be a judgy McJudgeton if. Now, these aren't nearly as funny, um, but these are good. This is good. This is good to open up. our. What, what environments do you have in your life? Do you have a bunch of environments in your life where you can go to a place, really be you, feel safe, a safe place to find and follow Jesus and open up your heart to say, God, what do you want to speak to me? Help me see my blind spots. Do you have a lot of those? I hope you do. But if you don't, this, this might be a good day. It might be helpful. I might be a judgy McJudgington if someone else's sin makes me feel spiritually superior instead of personally heartbroken. I might be a judgy McJudgington if more people, uh, if I'm more interested in what's wrong in you, then what's wrong in me? I might be if I treat suspicions and opinions as facts. I might be a judgy McJudgeton if my motivation is destruction rather than redemption. And this one's so true. I might be a judgy McJudgeton if I take joy in the downfall of another person. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 7 something that I think is we think like, yeah, I knew he said that when in Matthew 7, Jesus says, do not judge. I think we think, yeah, do not judge, period. I, get, I know that's Jesus. But if you read the rest of the verse, Jesus says, actually says, do not judge, comma, or you too will be judged. For in the same way, listen to this, everybody, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. As a parent, uh, we try to teach our kids the golden, golden rule. You know, the golden rule is, do unto others as you would have them do unto? Yeah, it's a good rule. I mean, I think it's one of the best to throw out there for your kids. But I think in this, Jesus is it's another golden rule he's given. I think it's judge unto others as you would have them judge unto you. In other words, you're going to reap what you sow. When you think you're the final authority willing to yield the gavel, it's like you might as well just go ahead and give that other person the gavel to judge you because that's what you're doing. So question is this, how, how do I prefer to be judged? Let me, let me ask that. How many of you, just about showing of hands when it comes to, well, if I'm going to be judged, I prefer to be judged, um, let's say, unfairly. Who, who would love to be judged unfairly? No one. I don't know about online, but in here, no hands. <laughs> let's try another one. How many of you prefer to be judged based on my past alone? 
No, no, nobody in here, nobody. How many of you say, I would, if I'm going to be judged, I'd love to be judged honestly. I mean, as opposed to deceitfully or dishonestly, I'm, yeah. But let me, let me put it in this way. How many of you, instead of jerseys today, we all come in and on our shirts is a list of the sins we've already committed in 2024 just right there on the shirt. Now, how many of you want to be judged honestly? Ooh. Never mind. Let me tell you how we would all or should all prefer to be judged. Mercifully. Let me ask you a question. Do you judge others as you'd like to be judged? I really think for Christians, that might be a game changer in our culture. I think we might better leverage our opportunity in culture when we do what Jesus said. This is how they will know you're my followers, how you love one another, how we hold to God's truth, but we also know, oh, God, may I judge others as you've judged me. How has God judged you? Mercifully. He says, or do you show contempt, verse 4, reminder, for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. It's all about Jesus' kindness. That's who he is. That's what he does. There'll be a day when he returns and he will judge accurately and precisely. But when he came in the flesh, God in the bod put on his earth suit, and he lived the life we should have lived, and he died the death we should have died. And he conquered sin, hell, death, and the grave, and was resurrected from the dead. When he did that, listen, everybody, when he came that time, he did not come to bring judgment or, 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 or to bring it. He came to bear it. He came to bear my judgment for me in his kindness, and in his kindness that leads us to repentance. So I want to close with a story. Um, so this is, uh, what Super Bowl is this? Anybody know what number? Nah, I don't know. Who cares? Okay, so that's the Super Bowl. And uh, in 2000, though, 2000, on January the 30th of 2000, there was another Super Bowl. And, and, in, and it was uh, um, the Rams versus the Titans. Um, but that is really insignificant, nothing to do with this message. But... On that night, what makes it significant for me is that was the first time that I missed watching the Super Bowl because I went to a church service. And on that night, on January 30th to 2000, the night of the Super Bowl, I surrendered my life to Christ. So I love football, by the way. And I'm going to watch the game. I'm going to eat. And I'm going to enjoy it. But the Super Bowl doesn't ever, even, ever come close after the past 24 years of, of having encounters with Christ. <laughs> it changed my life. And let me tell you why. So on that night, maybe you can relate in this church service. I don't remember anything the pastor preached about. Some of you are like, hey, man, I do relate now. Some of you are like, what? What happened? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Good to have you. Good to be here. So I don't remember anything he talked about, and I felt like such a fish out of water. Why? Because I had some serious mess. Because just a few days before, remember my friends telling me I think he got a problem? Well, that led to the destination of on New Year's Eve driving drunk off a ravine, and my friend died in my arms. So on January 30th, after New Year's, I go to a church service, and I'm not really listening because I'm like, do I want to be alive? I will never have joy again. How on earth did I end up here? How on earth my selfish decisions caused the death of my friend and destroyed some lives? Now, I don't know what you brought into church today, but I know what that's like. That's real. And then the pastor read a passage of scripture and my little spiritual antennas, maybe it had been a long time, went up and started listening. And here's what he read. Psalm 103, the Lord is compassionate and gracious and he's slow to anger. 
abounding in love. Listen, when, hey, listen real quick. Um, have you ever had a song in your life where you're like, I love that song, man. It's like changing my life. I'm all in. And you, 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 you get somebody else that is a friend, and you go, dude, listen to this song. And you're going to love this song. It's awesome. And, and then they listen to it, but they're not really listening. You're like, you're not really listening. And, and they're like, oh, I'm listening. Anybody ever have that happen? You're like, dude, hey, give, me, give me my phone back. You ain't listening to that. Do you know? Do you know that sometimes I feel like God feels that way with me? Man, I got a song that I think will change your life if you really lean in and listen. And I'm like, I'm listening. No, 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 you're not really listening. So at this point in my life, I was really listening because I was saying, God, is this really real? Can you really forgive someone like me? That's what I was wrestling with. It says, God will not always accuse nor harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Y'all, that's a definition of mercy. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Verse 11, I was like, is this real? For as high as the heavens are above the earth, I don't know how high that is, but it seems pretty far. So great is his love for those who revere him, fear him, don't reject him, are in awe of his mercy and grace. So far has he removed, as far as the east is from the west, our transgressions from us. And then listen to this, as a, who don't reject him, who revere him, who love him because he first loved them. In fact, they're in awe. That's what it literally means. They're in awe in worship of his mercy and his grace and his kindness. Where are you today in receiving God's mercy? And then when you respond to other people, how do you do at treating them as God has treated you? Let's pray. Father, I love you. Man, I thank you for every person in this room. Thank you for God's word. Thank you for your word, and thank you for the Apostle Paul writing it down. And Lord, I don't know where that lands with each person today, but I pray that we would leave this place different. We would leave this place just being so grateful for your patience and your kindness. In fact, that it would lead us to repentance wherever we are. And God, if we are a Christian, yielding the gavel of judgment and self-righteousness, may today be a day where we say, oh God, I need your rich patience, forbearance, and kindness. And may that lead them to repentance today. And then, Lord, if there are others that have not yet made you the Lord of, li of their lives, that today would be the day where they say, Jesus, thank you for coming to bear my judgment. Thank you, Lord, that you came to give me your grace and mercy. In fact, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, or maybe online, if you've not yet made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to invite you to pray with me. Today can be a day. You know, for me, golly, I think of 24 years from having received his mercy and kindness and goodness and all that the Lord has done. And maybe today would be a marker in your life where you surrender your heart to Christ. If that's you, I want to invite you to pray with me. You, you just pray along with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son. And Jesus, thank you for giving your life. Thank you for forgiving my sin. I give you my sin. Lord, I need your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy. Cleanse me, Lord. Change me. And if you're praying that, just say this. God, I, I give you my life. Jesus, I give you my life. I put my life in your hands. I surrender all to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Rock Hills, would you celebrate those that just made Jesus the Lord of their life? <laughs>